Assalamualaikum. Uh, good evening. Welcome to today's Ketem University 7. Uh, respected faculties from Women Abroad. Uh, Dr. Arif Rahman from USA. Welcome you to this session. And also our expert panelist. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, today's our uh, topics, political prediction of culpit artery in case of STMI. Today we will start the STMI session. In the month of December, we finish the STMI session and bifurcation. Uh, our discussion today, Professor Atharali sir, and today's speaker, one of the, my favorite speaker, my friend, Dr. Mahmoud Lafiros, is the most academic person in Bangladesh. Uh, so I welcome Mahmoud Lafiros to the session and Dr. Atharali sir as a discussion in the session. Professor Abdul Wadhusar, sir, please opening remarks and start the session. Good evening, everybody, and assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to this uh, session starting on the STME. And as an interventionist, we are very much inclined to know which artery is involved. So the, today's topic is very important for an interventionist. We have to know which one is the culprit artery. Sometimes it's very straightforward, sometimes it is not. But to go through those complicated cases when you are in a dilemma, which artery you should be thinking of intervening as a priority, that we I think we'll be getting some knowledge from Dr. Firuz's uh, lecture. And as we know, as uh, Professor Mohsin has already stated, uh, as Professor Dr. Mohamed Allah Firuz, is one of the very academic person, a very versatile person, uh, both academic and a good clinician and also a good speaker. So we hope to get dazzled by his brilliant lecture. Let's go for it. And everyone from home and abroad, the esteemed panelists from home and the panelists from abroad, our Professor Orun Maski, Dr. Arif, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And Atar Bhai, we are always lucky to have you amongst us. Thank you again. Dr. Mahmoud Lafiros, you share your screen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Abdul Wadud Chaudhary, sir, my teacher, and uh, Dr. Mohsin, my friend. Thank you for accepting me, uh, for inviting me in this session of IPDI CATLAB manual series. Um, Today we'll talk about ECG in localization of culprit artery, artery in ST elevation MI. And uh, ischemic heart disease is the leading cause of death worldwide. We, every one of us uh, know about this. The incidence rate of STEMI in our country is not known, but in European countries like in Sweden, it is around 58 per 100,000 per year. In India, it is estimated around 40 to 50, their survey says. So if we take, it is around 40 per 100,000 per year in Bangladesh. Every year, around 35,000 people in Bangladesh, adult people in Bangladesh suffer from a STEMI. That means every day, 90 to 100 STEMI cases are there in Bangladesh. There are much improvement in STEMI treatment regarding detection, regarding treatment, regarding pharmaceuticals, everything. But still the mortality remains substantial. In the in-hospital mortality of unselected patients with STEMI in the national registries of the ESC countries varies from 4 to 12 percent. And how do we define STEMI? There are universal definition depending on the rise and fall of troponin I. But for practical purpose, most of the time we use the symptom of the patient that is chest discomfort along with ECG changes for definition of stale elevation MI. It is also endorsed by ESC 2017 guideline. And early reverse correlation by primary PCI has been already established about 20 years back that it works, it works better than the no therapy, it better work. Uh, works better than uh, the pharmacological therapy. So for detection of the, for helping the interventionalist, for taking decision on the part of the interventionalist, 
uh, in primary PCI, we need this. Why it is more important? Because in many cases, we find multivacillaries. In fact, in STEMI patients, we get 40% of the cases, we get multivacillaries. So it becomes important to know which one is the culprit artery. And you know about the recommendation regarding the primary PCI that they recommend to intervene the primary PCI, uh, culprit artery mainly. Whether we should use non-culprit artery or not, that is controversial. And the controversy will go on for more time. So every, every guideline, SAC and ESC recommends that ECG should be done in each and every patient once the patient comes to the hospital. And it should be done within 10 minutes of time of uh, arrival at the emergency department. And it should be repeated if the patient develops symptoms or a diagnosis is made. In this discussion, we'll concentrate on two important things. This is the features of stellation MI and how we can detect the probable culprit artery. So the ECG features of stellation MI was first described by Harold Pardee in New York in 1920. He published the first ECG of AMI in human and describes the T wave as being tall and it starts from a point well up on the descent of the R wave, that is ST elevation. And to me, ECG is like some Lilliputians looking at a Gallagher. There are multiple knobs put on different angles in the frontal plane and in the uh, limb, limb plane. And this looks at the heart from different angle, gives us the information. We gather all these informations and try to find out the final diagnosis. In 2.1% of the patients with AMI are inadvertently discharged from emergency department, mostly due to normal ECC. And 30 days mortality of this patient is around 10.5%. This is very high. In my in emergency department, 50% of them has got a diagnostic ECG, that is ST elevation or ST depression. But in 35% patient, there is non-specific changes and 7.9% cases, there is normal ECG. So the detection of the ECG, uh, myocardial infarction with ECG is very important. And we know all these changes already. There is elevation of the uh, tall peaked T wave followed by ST elevation. There is reduction of the S wave and J point elevation leading to ST elevation and similar things with the other forms of ECG also. So the ST elevation is important and this ST elevation is with convexity upward and this concavity upward is a wrong one. So ST, when do, how do we define it, this ST elevation? This ST elevation is just at the J point. That means where the S wave ends and the ST segment starts. If it is one millimeter or 0.1 millifold or more in elevation in lateral or inferior leads or anterior leads, or in case of V2, V3, if it is more than 1.5 millifold, then it is known as significant ST segment elevation. ST segment elevation is compared with the isoelectric line that is TP segment. And this criteria correctly classified with a sensitivity of around 56% and a specificity of 94%. And there are a number of non-ischemic causes of ST elevation. We should think about it. And this non-specific causes of ST elevation can lead to a false diagnosis of ST elevation MI. In fact, there are different registries which has reported that the false activation of primary PCI team is around 15 to 40%. And most of the time, it is because of the misinterpretation of the ECG. And this has got a number of impact on the patient's cost, hospital cost, the work schedule of the uh, doctors and everything. So proper identification of ST elevation MI is important. There are several things which should come in differential diagnosis of ST elevation MI. One is early repolarization. Function in a patient with old MI, this is also an important one. Sometimes it becomes difficult to diagnose ST elevation MI in a patient who has got previous history of MI also. And we can compare the T wave with QR amplitude 
in and if the ratio is indicator of this one it, that can give rise to a diagnosis of the st elevation ami in a previous ami another important thing in diagnosis in ecg of st elevation ami is q wave sometimes we think that appearance of q wave means the myocardial is lost so there is no role of reperfusion the idea is wrong it is not a reliable sign of irreversible damage this is fact that the presence of q wave indicates a larger ischemic zone and ultimate infarct size is high and there is increase in hospital mortality but this does not indicate that this patient does need reperfusion either by thrombolysis or primary pci in fact the treatment of this patient early uh, reperfusion by means of thrombolytic and primary pci can change their hospital mortality can change their long term uh, mortality and morbidity so whenever we get a stale elevation mi we try to def define it depending on this artery the, the wall of the heart we can call it uh, name it by means of inferior mi when the two three avf leads are involved we can call it a lateral wall mi when the one and avl is involved uh, along with b5 b6 we can call it a anteroceptral mi when the v1 v2 is involved and we can call it a anterior mi when v3 to v4 v3 and v4 and other leads are involved sometimes multiple leads are involved in a single setting then uh, like inferior mi with anterior mi or extensive anterior mi we'll talk about it later one so this is the this is how we describe it in the form of inferior mi anterior mi anteroceptral mi and two important thing is posterior mi and right ventricular mi so regarding identification of the culprit artery in stemi primary pci should be performed as quickly as possible with the goal of a medical contact to balloon or door to balloon interval of around 90 minutes we know about it pci should not be performed in a non infarct artery at the time of primary pci in patients without hemodynamic compromise so we should have to define the culprit artery and we can define it by ecg before going for angiogram and we can use this ecg to find out the amount of myocardium and find out the prognosis of the patient the common site of culprit lesion in acute uh, coronary syndrome is in the proximal part of the arteries like led lcx and rca at the site of bifurcation and at the site of the angulation like this the proximal part of the artery angulated part of the artery at the angle part of the artery we know about uh, everything about the ecg pattern may not be same in all cases with similar coronary artery occlusion this is very important because there is variability in coronary anatomy the size may be of different the led may be of type 1 to type 4 size there may be lcx dominant there may be rca dominant the arteries or branches like om branches rv branches or diagonal branches of maybe of different sizes in fact there may be multifacet disease there may be previous mi all these things influences the ecg pattern in st elevation mi the size and exact location of the vascular bed supplied by the occluded occluded artery, uh, artery also varies so we know very well that the right coronary artery supplies the um, inferior part of the left ventricle and also the right ventricle and also the infant face area anterior area also to the distal one third of the inferior surface of the uh, left ventricle and also the anterolateral part so by defining that if we get the st elevation mi in the inferior leads most likely diagnosis is either the lesion is in the right coronary artery or left coronary artery if it is in the anterior leads most likely it is in the left anterior descending artery if it is in the anterolateral leads most likely the lesion is in the left circumflex bounds of the left anterior descending artery so this is how we define it and how can we identify the culprit artery in inferior mi 
by ECG, from ECG. In inferior MI, in 76% cases, the culprit artery is right coronary artery. And in 20% cases, the culprit artery is left circumflex artery. And in 3% cases, it may be different. It may be a type 4 LED or any other thing. When right coronary artery shown to be the infarct related artery, the patients often undergo right ventricular infarction. There may be AV conduction defect. There is more hemodynamic compromise and the mortality and morbidity is also high. The prognosis for those with LC excretion is much better. How can we differentiate this RC and LCX lesion? One of the important things is ST elevation in lead three and lead two. If the ST elevation is more in the lead three than lead two, that means it is a RC elevation. We can look at the AVL light. If the ST depression is more in the AVL lead than one, lead one, most likely the lesion is in the RCA. We can look at the ST depression in V123. The sum of this depression along with the sum of the elevation in 2-3 AVF, it is, if it is less than the limb lead elevations, then most likely the diagnosis is RCA elevation. There are some other simple way, like the ST depression, if the ST depression is V3 is less than ST elevation in lead 3, that indicates a RC elevation. Decrease in R wave amplitude and an increase in S wave amplitude, that is SR ratio, if it is more than 3 in AVL, that also indicates an RC elevation. And ST elevation in V1, if it is more than V2, that indicates RV infarction and most likely the diagnosis is RC elevation. And these are the things by which we can measure the things. Uh, identify the RC and LCX lesions. And there are different sorts of sensitivity and specificity, which is more or less high in regarding the sensitivity, but the specificity is low for all these parameters. And they have tried some different scoring systems like right coronary artery score, like culprit score for identification of the coronary arteries, the culprit coronary artery in case of inferior MI. Look at this ECG. This is an inferior AMI. So what could be the possible lesion? What could be the culprit artery? If you look at the lead three and lead two, the ST elevation is definitely more in the lead three than lead two. That means most likely this is a right coronary artery lesion. If you look at the AVL, there is ST depression, which is an indication of right coronary artery lesion. In case of LCX, the ST is usually isoelectric or there is elevation of the ST segment. If you compare the ST depression between one and AVL, the ST depression in AVL is higher. This also indicates a right coronary artery lesion. And the ST depressions in the V1 and V2, V3, if you compare the ST elevation in the v uh, lead 3 and ST depression in V3, this ST elevation is higher. This also indicates that this patient has got a right coronary artery lesion. And let's see how was the angiographic lesion? This is the angiographic lesion. And you can appreciate that there is total occlusion of the right coronary at the mid part. And this is the, and this is the left sided has got no significant lesion in the left coronary artery. And this is the epicranial view showing the left anterior descending artery. And following primary PCI, there is good establishment of the right coronary artery lesions. And there are, uh, as I have already said, there is a culprit score by which we can also de define which artery is the culprit artery, whether it is a right coronary artery or a left coronary artery. If you look at this ECG, this is also an inferior MIH lesion. But if you see the ST elevation lead to, it is more than the lead three. So most likely this is a LCX lesion. If you look at the STD segment in AVL, it is isoelectric, no depression. So this also indicates that a LCX lesion. And the ST depression in the V2, V3 with upright T wave, this also indicates a posterior MI, along with this inferior MI, which is also a feature of left circumflex artery lesion. So by all these things, 
we can define that this patient may have got a inferior MI with a culprit artery in the left circumflex artery. There are many other ways, like STD, the common three common ways, ST elevation in lead three more than lead two, right coronary artery, ST depression in lead one and AVL or both, and ST depression in AVL is more than lead one, right coronary artery. We can also look at the V4R. If there is ST elevation in V4R, that also indicates a right coronary artery. We can use this V4R in other ways. If there is ST elevation in V4R, that indicates a proximal right coronary artery lesion. If it is isoelectric or elevation is less than one millimeter, this indicates distal right coronary artery lesion. And if there is a depression in V4R, that indicates a left circumflex artery lesion. So this is a patient with inferior AMI. Then the right side and DCG shows elevation in the V4R. That means most likely this patient has got a proximal right coronary artery lesion. There are many other ways by many flow chart uh, for detection of this artery. One I have already mentioned that if the ST elevation is in three is more than two and ST segment depression in one and AVL or both and the ratio is more, uh, more than one millimeter. If these two things are yes, most likely it is a right coronary artery lesion. And if there is the ST segment elevation in V1 or V4R, it will be in proximal artery, coronary right coronary artery. If this is absent, it will be distal right coronary artery lesion. And if these things are absent, most likely the lesion is in the left circumflex artery. And there are different, uh, uh, relatively good sensitivity and specificity for all these three criteria. This is one lesion, like the similar one, we can buy this uh, ECG, we can say that this patient most likely have a right coronary artery lesion. And with angiogram, you can show that this patient has got a right coronary artery lesion and following PCI, this lesion is uh, uh, visualization of the right coronary artery. Now come to the anterior MI with lesion proximal to the septal one. How can we detect it? In this case, there will be ST elevation in the AVR. There may be complete right coronary branch block. There will be ST depression in V5 and ST elevation in V1, more than 2.5 millimeter. If these criteria are present, any of them or a combination of these criteria, that indicates the LED occlusion proximal to the septal one. And ST depression in ST elevation in V1 to V2 uh, predicts culprit lesion proximal to the receptor bands, as I have already mentioned. So in this ECG, there is right, uh, right bundle bus block, there is ST elevation in the V1, there is ST elevation in the AVR. That indicates that this patient may have got a LED lesion in the proximal part, proximal to the septal one. This may be also a lesion in the left main artery or combination of the left main equivalent, but definitely it has got a lesion proximal to the septal one. And this is the ECG or angiographic angiogram of the patient. And this indicates, we can see that the left main is minimal disease, left sacrobex is normal, but there is a very proximal left anterior descending artery lesion, total occlusion of the left anterior descending artery. You can appreciate this from this spider view also. And this is the epicranial view showing there is a total absence of the LED following this total occlusion. And following primary PCI, there is well visualization and TME3 flow in the LED lesion. And how can we detect lesion proximal to the diagonal one? The diagonal one branch usually supplies the anterolateral part of the left ventricle. So, so if the diagonal branch is occluded, there will be ST elevation in the one AVL leads. If there is a Q wave ST elevation in one AVL or there is a Q wave in one AVL, that indicates the LED lesion is proximal to the diagonal one. Not only that, in case of proximal to diagonal one lesion, there is ST depression in the inferior leads. So if a patient with anterior MI if there is ST depression in the inferior lead, that indicates that the patient has got a LED lesion proximal to the diagonal one, like this one. This patient has got a anterior myocardial infarction. There is ST depression in the inferior leads, 
and there is ST elevation in AVL and one. Most likely, this patient has got a lesion proximal to the diagonal one, proximal to the diagonal one. And this is the angiogram of the patient. The right coronary artery more or less normal. This is the left coronary artery showing the LED lesion along with the lesion in the diagonal branch. This is the lesion which involves the LED as well as the diagonal branch and following primary PCI, there is well visualization of the uh, left coronary artery, left anti-descending artery. And if the Q waves are present in V4, V6, associated with usually uh, uh, distal to the circulation, that means if there is no ST elevation or Q wave in V1, there is no ST elevation or Q wave in 1 and AVL, there is ST elevation limited to V3 to 6 or V4 to 6 that indicates the there is a distal lesion, distal to the septal one and distal to the diagonal one. Like this one, this patient has got a no elevation in the one and AVL. There is minimal elevation in the V1, but there is elevation in the V2 on, on the way to the other parts. And this is the angiogram of the patient, the left coronary artery. If you look at this thing, there is a total occlusion of the LED following diagonal branch and also the after septal one. And this is the post-PCI feature of the patient. So by these things, we can, you can different, there are different flow charts by the um, exact lesion where it is in the LED. The, Important leads are one and AVL. If it is involved, the lesion is proximal to the diagonal. Important leads are V1, AVR, RBB. If these lesions are these leads are involved, the lesion is proximal to the S1. And if it is if these leads not are involved, that means the lesion in LED is distal to the these leads. And these are the different is a, a condition like this one the patient has got a ST elevation in the in all these leads. There is no in the AVL one and there is no elevation in the AVR and minimal elevation in the V1. Most likely this patient has got a LED lesion distal to the S1 and D1. And by this flow chart, you can also determine where, where is the lesion. ST elevation in V1 to V3 if there is V1 in V1, if it is more than 2.5 millimeter or there is a right bundle branch block that indicates the proximal LED lesion. If the ST depression in 2-3 ABF more than 1 millimeter, that indicates a LED lesion proximal to the diagonal artery. And if there is ST depression, ST segment depression in 2-3 ABF is less than 1 or ST segment elevation in 2-3 ABF that indicates the LED lesion is distal to the diagonal artery. So these are the diseases by which we can determine. This indicates the patient has got a RBB, anterior MI, but the one and AVL shows isoelectric. This indicates this patient has got a LED lesion distal to diagonal one, but proximal to septal one. This is the, this is how we can determine the lesion. Sometimes you can get um, ST elevation both in the anterior lead and the inferior lead. In case of, in, in fact, in 15% of patients with anterior MI, you will can get ST elevation both in the anterior lead and inferior lead. This may happen due to many causes, number of causes. One important cause is wrap around LED. That means type four, type four LED. If there is a occlusion in the type four LED, this can lead to elevation both in the anterior lead and inferior lead. It can also happen because of a lesion in the superdominant right coronary artery. If the distal part of the LV, that can also lead to uh, both the anterior and inferior infarct at the same time. And of course, the multiversal disease that is involving both RC and LED can also lead to both wall MI, that is anterior and inferior wall MI. Like this one, this patient has got a anterior MI along with the elevation in the inferior leads. 
that means both the anterior lid is anterior wall is involved also the inferior wall is involved in this case the most likely diagnosis uh, 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 diagnosis may be two number most likely wrap around led that is type 4 led and it the differential diagnosis is a super dominant right coronary artery which is very rare most of the time it is because of wrap around led one of the important thing in this type 4 led if the lesion is in the proximal part that is proximal to the diagonal one on that case the inferior lead changes are absent if the lesion is distal to the diagonal one in that case there will be elevation both in the anterior and inferior leads so if we get a elevation both in the anterior and inferior leads if we think this is a diagonal a trap around led or type 4 led that means the culpit diagonal one branch like this one this patient has got a type 4 led and the lesion is lesion was distal to the diagonal one sometimes we can get lateral wall am i only in the one and avl lead and this lateral wall is supplied by left circumflex artery by through its om branches it can be by means of first diagonal artery it may be dry ramus intermedius artery how can we differentiate all these three uh, these three things in case of first diagonal artery there will be st elevation in v2 and the st will be isoelectric or there will be depression in v3 and v6 if there is a isolated first diagonal artery branch on lesion uh, on that case the st elevation will be v2 in v2 but the isoelectric st or st depression v3 to v6 in case of first marginal branch or first wm branch lesion there will be st depression in v2 this is how we can differentiate it like this one this patient has got a st elevation in 1 and avl that means this patient has got a lateral wall mi if you look at the v2 it is it is not elevated at least may be depressed so the lesion is at wm1 in the lcx artery if you go for the angiogram of this patient the right coronary artery is normal the left coronary artery shows a significant lesion at the level of the wm1 branch significant lesion and following the led is normal and following primary pci there is a good flow in the left circumflex artery and also the wm1 is visualized so by these things we can we can determine which is the culpit artery in case of lateral wall mi the important lead is v2 if there is st elevation in v2 without v3 and v6 that indicates a diagonal artery if there is st depression in v2 along with one and avl avl elevation that indicates a wm1 branch you can use avr for culpit artery localization in different things you know that avr looks at the posterior lateral uh, upper part of the upper part of the heart mainly the infundibular part of the right ventricle and basal part of the left ventricle and this part is supplied by the right coronary artery and proximal part of the led so if there is st elevation in avr it can be due to proximal led lesion or left main lesion or proximal rc lesion in case of inferior mi on the other hand the distal part of if there is the mi in distal part due to distal lcx lesion or distal led lesion on that case there will be depression in the avr so by observing this st segment in avr both in the anterior mi and inferior mi we can uh, we can guess where is the lesion in case of inferior mi if there is avr elevation that indicates a proximal rc lesion in case of led lesion anterior mi if there is a avr elevation that indicates a proximal led lesion or left main lesion and if there is a avr depression that indicates a distal led lesion and also it can happen because of the circumflex lesion and look at this specificity it is high enough around 96 and 94% in both led and circumflex lesion as i have already mentioned that the st elevation mi most of the cases in 40% cases we get multi vessel disease number of vessels may be involved in the uh, st elevation mi in in 2.5% cases of st elevation mi 
there may be acute occlusion of more than one vessel. This usually happens in hypercoagulable state. And uh, like in COVID era, you can get more than one vessel, more than one vessel of total occlusion during ST elevation MI. And the combination may be RC and LCX in 50% cases. In 28%, it is RC and LED and 22% cases LED and LCX. And most of the time they present with inferior AMI, but it can present with inferior and posterior AMI and can present also with anterior AMI. The important thing when there is multivessel disease, there is ischemia in different wall. There may be injury one in or AMI in one wall, which will try to increase the, uh, there will be ST elevation on that wall. On the other hand, there will be, there may be ischemia in the another wall and uh, which can influence these ST elevation or this ST elevation can influence the ST depression in the other wall. So the typical feature of the ECG detection for culprit artery may not be present in case of multifacial disease because of the nullifying of these two electrical factors with one another. And there are a number of um, studies by which they try to identify the multifacial disease, but this is always a difficult one to detect multifacial disease, this one. Uh, this is a case reported in the uh, Ox, uh, Oxford Medical Case Reports Forum. And this was the initial ECG of the patient with the chest pain lesion. And there is a ST depression in the, they thought about the posterior MI, the V7 and V8 shows elevation. So their diagnosis was a posterior MI. And they, tried to go for an angiogram primary, for primary PCI. There is occlusion of the left circumflex artery, and there is also occlusion of the left anterior descending artery. So which one is the culprit lesion? Definitely there are different angiographic criteria by which you can detect the culprit lesion, like presence of thrombus and all other things. But in this case, the person thinks that there is this is the culprit lesion. So they reverse clearance this LCX. And for keeping this LED lesion for the related innovation. But 30 minutes after that, or after uh, after the primary PCI, uh, they found that there is ST elevation in the anterior leads also. So the anterior lead, anterior MI is shown in the following PCI, and they have gone for the primary PCI. The possible explanation of it may be the anterior lead change and the inferior lead change nullified the two vectors, and there was no change in the anterior lead during the initial period. And the second explanation may be there is a delay in the visualization of the or development of the ST segment changes in the anterior lead. So this is also important thing that in multiple cell PCI, you can not, in, in case of multiple, multiple cell infarction, you may not get the typical feature of this. You can look at the conduction system also. In, we know very well that the SA node is mainly supplied by the right coronary artery. AV node is supplied mostly by the right coronary artery in 90% cases. His bundle is supplied by right coronary artery and LED both. Right bundle is right bundle is mainly supplied by the left anterior descending artery by the first septal branch. The left bundle, the anterior fascicle is supplied by the left anterior descending artery and the posterior fascicle is supplied by this right coronary artery. So by visualizing the ECG, by observing the conduction defect, you can also guess which is the which is the culprit lesion. Like if a patient has got a, a sinus node dysfunction with acute MI, that can indicate a right coronary artery lesion, proximal right coronary artery lesion. If there is a V conduction defect in a patient with um, uh, MI, that may be most likely is a right coronary artery lesion. And similarly in the fascicular blocks and RPPO also. Sometimes you may get actual infarction in patients with ventricular MI also. It is common um, in the right atrial cases. It may be biatrial in 20% cases. It may be isolated left atrial infarction in 22 to 20% cases. This atrial infarction mainly happens because of the atrial branch occlusion in patients with right coronary artery lesions. And it can happen with also left coronary, left circumflex artery lesions. So if you get a patient with atrial infarction with MI, most likely inferior MI, the 
possible lesion is proximal RCA, which is occluding also the right coronary artery. So in conclusion, ECG remains the gold standard for identifying the presence and location of acute myocardial ischemia or to be more specific, ST elevation MI. ECG can detect the culprit artery in ST elevation MI with relatively high sensitivity and specificity. For evidence of reperfusion also, ECG is very important. In fact, ECG is called gold standard. According to Eric Jetopol, it is a platinum standard for evidence of reperfusion. ECG features may be influenced by a number of factors, starting from the PVSMI, chamber enlargement, electrolyte imbalance, number of vessel involved, and also the patient other factors. This can influence the ECG features. At times, the changes are typical and clear. We can detect the possible lesion in most of the cases, but in other cases, these changes may be subtle, and we have to <laughs> think about the, um, more delicately about these things. Availability, availability of prior ECG tracing and repeat ECG changes enhances the accuracy of the reading. And thank you all for your patience hearing. Uh, thank you, Mamadila Firoz. Excellent elaborate presentation. I hope uh, it is a more elaborate presentation. You include all the things in this presentation. We are happy at uh, the We are, uh, I think, our goal is to reach our goal. Thank you, Dr. Mamadila Firoz. I uh, am the Chief Officer Abdul Aziz Chudi, sir. Professor Wadud, sir. Can you hear me? Firoz, I am really lucky. I'm really lucky to I got to hear this lecture. Excellent presentation. But I have a question. Let's say some patient have a pacemaker. How do I recognize the artery is involved? Is there any clue to that? Uh, in fact, the, uh, in case of pacemaker, we get the left bundle bunch block most of the time. Left bundle bunch block, uh, the there is some studies where they try to correlate this left bundle branch block type of ECG or pacemaker ECG with uh, culprit artery, but uh, the clear cut recommendation is there is no recommendation that these features will be representative of RC edition or L edition or LC expression. They are equally distributed in uh, RC edition, LC expression, and LC. Yeah, that's the clue. Actually, if, if the patient have LBBB or the patient have pacing ECG, you can recognize if the MI is there, but you cannot recognize which artery is involved. And ECHO may help you, but not the ECG. Can I make a comment? Yes, yes sir. I'm Christian by Professor Watari, sir. Yeah. Now, comment on this question, Professor Wadud so this question. Comment, comment. Actually, yeah. 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 Actually, what are the situation? That is, what are the limitation of ECT for localizing the culprit artery in case of the HTMI? This is one of the example. That is the pacemaker patient. In addition, all the patient who has got the got already the repolarization changes like the bundle branches, or depending on the dominance, sometimes the patient has got the right dominance or left dominance or already Firoz has mentioned that the patient who has got the multifacial disease or previous MI. So these are the situation where there is a limitation of the uh, localization of the ST elevated by the ECG alone. Uh, the pacemaker is one of the example where there is a late bundle branch block that is revolution abnormality. So these are the, some of the limitation of the ECG for this uh, localization. Firoz, I have another question. Uh, is there any Difficulty in recognizing the culprit artery if the patient has WPW. Actually, I have got no idea, sir. I have any article or anything. That's why I was asking if, if somebody can. No, actually, this is also included in this category. There is a loose. Uh, possibly, uh, what if I can remember the emergency book for uh, decision making by the Professor Hayes. That is, uh, uh, that is uh, Netherlands, that is our the, the, the renowned professor. In his book, there is a, there is a list. That is, what are the limitations of the uh, ECG for localizing the arterial lesion? That is, uh, so 
a pre excitation is one of that as because this patient has got the late bundle branch block so uh, here that this formula does not work properly that is a localization formula that is a uh, pre excitation pacemaker lbb rbb may have got some so these are the some areas where the ecg localization is not possible for accurately इश्यूज I want I want to raise a question for the excellent panelists. That is a, a good number of the renowned cardiologists here. Heroes, why the ECG is used only for the STMI, not for the non-STMI? This is the first question we have to answer. Why why this theory is applicable only for the STMI, not for the non-STMI? Whether the ECG does work for the localization of STMI in the case non-STMI? Uh, sir in case of non stmi is it usually think thought that it is mostly subendocardial uh, part do this theory is not valid always and the changes are diffuse changes are diffuse so the uh, in case of non st elevation mi the ecg changes are not that much uh, helpful in localizing the culpitatory except in few cases like in the um uh, the wallen sign type a and type b which indicates that the patient has got uh, ld reduction or if a patient has got a non stmi with avr elevation that indicates a left main lesion or triple basin disease or if a patient has got a non stmi with lateral lead st depression b4 5 6 st depression that also indicates a triple basin disease or multi basin disease these are the thing by which we can determine the multi basin disease or left main disease or sometimes the led lesion but not specifically the rca lesion or lcx lesion cannot be uh, truly identified by in case of non stmi by ecg uh, i think i will raise another thing uh, very often i see patients who have been diagnosed as case of non stmi but after seeing the ecg i tell my assistant do a posterior only and i find that actually the patient had posterior mi A true posterior MI is very underdiagnosed in this country, and many of the non-STMI actually are posterior MI. So that's another caveat that we have to look into. And as Firuz was saying, non-STMI actually very often indicates either a very branch disease or very extensive disease. And it sometimes it's harbingers. of a major mi in making for example if for a, a, you have a non stmi and you do and you and find out the proximal lt has 99% occlusion 1% is remaining the patient is very lucky to have that mi because the muscle damage is minimum and he had been forced to into doing the angiogram and find out where the lesion is and he has undergone revascularization that's quite lucky for him so all non stmi patient should be given enough importance for uh, visualization imaging like angiography or something like that that we have to uh, pay attention to but we cannot localize the artery from non stmi in case of non stmi because the ic changes are not that subtle not that prominent sir any comment or any or any to discuss any professor meshkat Yeah, yes uh, for for isolated involvement of posterior myocardial infarction it has been recommended for years that when we suspect a patient that whose feature is very typical of myocardial infarction in those cases you have to do the ecg at 20 minutes interval so that we do not miss the posterior mi also it is uh, also it is advisable for those patient to insert the lead 8 and lead 9 Uh, uh, so that we do not uh, add something, But, please. Actually, uh, the tremors. There is another called mirror image effect. 
I mean, if you see the ECG from the front, you see ST depression V1, V2. But if you turn around the ECG, you see the ST elevation in V1, V2, which is a posterior MI, true posterior MI. Very rare circumstances, of course, but this is another indication of true posterior MI. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, what as, I regard, as regard today's presentation, it has really been excellent. Excellent presentation, excellent as, presentation. As, as usual, yeah. and things has been made very clear and very lucent. Main attractive thing was the uh, uh, corresponding uh, angiographic finding that yeah. he has shown. It has really been excellent. Today's topic has brought me into 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 another 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 uh, space. Space is that today Rose has introduced uh, topics to localize the lesion in order to have uh, in order to find out the culprit lesion for PCI. Look at the ST segment depression in case of ST elevation MI. In our mind, the vector of ST segment in, that occurs in myocardial infarction, the lead that are distal to the uh, uh, infarction and, and the reflection in those leads. This is why this is important, you know. Uh, in recent time with acute coronary syndrome, people are being coming in the emergency department with very atypical symptom. They are coming to whom we, we do not suspect the myocardial infarction. Of acute syndrome are occurring in women. And in those cases, atypical symptom, women, young, we ought to miss the uh, acute coronary syndrome. But those are the cases where, you have, where we have to look very meticulously in the ECG. We don't miss anything. In that respect, the depression of ST elevation may come before the elevation of ST in the, in the infarct related. That is a very important point. So what Firoz has shown today, the lead that can be involved distal to the myocardial infarction lead if hints to earlier detection of the myocardial infarction, which has shown in, in, in many, many cases. So today's topic has been so important, so important topic, so mind blowing and so thought provoking. And we should practice all these things so that we do not miss the MI cases. But, uh, that, is that is why this lecture has attracted me so much. Thank you. Uh, sir. Yeah, thank sir. you. Thank sir. you. Firoz, as usual, has presented in a very meticulous and attractive manner. Actually, there are a lot of uh, cardiology residents uh, listening to this lecture. They might be a bit perplexed about the different intricacies of uh, ECG interpretation. So uh, they, I, I would uh, suggest them to not to go into much details, uh, just to learn the basics of the ECG. And there are some situations uh, which might confuse us uh, in, uh, in interpreting a ST elevation MI. As Professor Vadud has said, that uh, uh, he has uh, de uh, described about the posterior MI being misinterpreted as non-ST MI. And we all know that in case of inferior myocardial infarction, the ST segment uh, elevation is often very transient. And these cases are also sometimes misinterpreted as uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, but they are actually uh, ST elevation inferior myocardial infarction. And in some uh, instances, like uh, the fringe metal angina can confuse us, the uh, acute MI with pericarditis can confuse us. Uh, so we have to be remain uh, vigilant about interpreting those ECGs and which might not correlate uh, very well with the angiographic findings in some time. And in the COVID era, the myocarditis can also uh, 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 lead us to, uh, to early angiography uh, unless we are very vigilant about the clinical background of the patient. So uh, while interpreting the ECG, and uh, it's a remember to uh, do an ECG fresh in the hospital. Don't rely on the ECG done outside the hospital. There might be some improper uh, lead placement, the, particularly the reversed electrode and the chest lead malposition can confuse us as well. So uh, it is better to do 
rely on the ECG done inside the hospital after the patient gets admitted. So it might uh, uh, need some extra time, but it's worth spending this time uh, before uh, taking the patient to the cath lab. Thank you very much, Piroz, and uh, thanks to the, all the panelists. Hello, can I add something? Khaled Bhai has a, uh, pointed a very important thing. Just yesterday, a patient of mine who had acute inferior mind, the sister has done that. The outside ST was showing classical inferior mind, ST lesion and everything. In the, uh, the hospital, first ECD shows the ST lesion in one and AVL, but there is a straight line in uh, that was in, I think, in AVL or AVF, something like that. So I said, you have transposed uh, leg leads with hand leads, arm leads. Do it properly again. Then she did it again properly, and we got our inferior mind back. So if you get a straight line in any of the limb leads, remember that there's something wrong with that ECG. Don't interpret it. Ask for another ECG properly lead placed. In these cases where there is not hand uh, transposition, arm transposition is very easy. We can recognize it, technical astrocardia. But when there is leg and left leg and left arm or right leg or right arm transposition, you will get a bizarre ECG that will sometimes totally misinterpret the ECG, mispresent ECG. You get a lateral wall MI in case of acute inferior MI, something like that. You will be totally confused. So that's a lesson. I think I, I, if I had known, I would have bring that ECG today. Mohsin, I need to supplement for you. Act minute, gentlemen. ST segment. Those are lecture three, gentlemen. Hello, ST elevation. The depression is very important. Halle, Mohsin, just tell us. I am telling you, the best way not to miss the inferior MI is to look at AVL. Look at depression in the AVL as uh, as Firoz has shown. Uh, I'm going to miss the inferior MI. Uh, and Wadud, you are so right. When the ECG is in, in interpretable or the baseline is, is disturbed, we must discard that ECG with suspected acute coronary syndrome. Uh, Professor Ekumrija, sir. Professor Ekumrija, do you hear me, sir? Professor Ekumrija. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Firoz, for brilliant presentation. Actually, I am waiting for uh, seven days uh, to uh, uh, to listen to the lecture of Dr. Firoz that uh, I have an extra interest about the uh, ECG interpretation uh, of culprit artery lesion in acute MI. Uh, it's a brilliant presentation, but uh, in practical purpose, actually, uh, in our CCU or in our practice, we do not practice this. This is the main problem. We are very much uh, superficial of ECG interpretation, whether it is inferior MI, whether it is entry MI, or whether it is lateral MI. Uh, we, we cannot very keen about the ECG uh, reading. Uh, if we uh, read the ECG properly, I think ECG can tell everything, but uh, it is our, uh, I think, uh, uh, we, are, we are very much uh, not that much interested or that much we are not uh, uh, read about the ECG. That's why we miss ECG, but uh, ECG can tell everything to us uh, from uh, so far I know. But uh, in some situation in acute MI, uh, from my experience that uh, we already discussed that the non-ST segment elevated MI, that is normal ECG with typical chest pain, this patient, uh, I evaluated a lot of patients by bedside echocardiography. Typical chest pain, normal, repeated normal ECG, then I decide to do a bedside echo. And bedside echo tell me the right thing that yes, this chest pain is from uh, acute MI. And I did this patient uh, primary PCI and uh, subsequently 
uh, I found that there is a lesion in any artery like RC or LED. So uh, only uh, we, we do not uh, rely on ECG in acute situation for the management. But uh, that is not the uh, uh, discussion today. Today's discussion is ECG interpretation of uh, culprit artery in acute MI. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Firoz elaboratedly uh, explain everything. But uh, I think there is some uh, other uh, areas that we cannot evaluate or we cannot discover it from ECG. Subsequently, if we uh, keen to it to evaluate the ECG properly, then we can uh, actually read the ECG and we can uh, we will not miss the ECG and the actual uh, area of infarction. That is my feeling. I don't know. Yeah, without you, any ECG, without any ECG change, nothing can ha happen in heart. This is my belief. I don't know. Yes, you are, you are, <laughs> you are uh, uh, with my. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have two international experts here, Dr. Rudin Maski. Professor Maski. Thank you. This was a brilliant lecture. I mean, this is a very good lecture. The most important thing is uh, rather, I mean, last time uh, we had one case discussion. So what is required is do not rely always on ECG. See, if you look at this uh, sensitivity of uh, ECG in diagnosis, M MI is 70 to 80%, not much. With the ST elevation MI and reciprocal ST depression. So sometimes you may not get those uh, ST elevations. So you have to rely one on history. If you get uh, reciprocal ST depression, that's very important. And the most important thing is you should not be missing left mid lesions. Multiple ST depression and ST elevation in AVR or V1s are very, very important signs, which is a left mid stenosis. And another important finding is circumflex lesions are missed easily. So they go posteriorly. So we'll have to do uh, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Meskat was saying, you'll have to do seven to nine leads, say V1 and V2. So these are the things which uh, we should be doing. And this was a very fantastic lecture. So based uh, before going to any patients with the history, we have to look uh, ECG minutely and plan accordingly. Like if I as said earlier, if you have multiple leads and ST elevation in a V1 or AVR leads, then your approach to that patient going through primary PCI would be very different. Similarly, osteal or proximal lesions, your approach would be different. So these lesions are very, very helpful. And so thank you, IPDI. Thank you, uh, Professor Vadud, Mohsin, and Firoz, always doing a good job. And these classes are so uh, popular. We have a lot of residents from Nepal at least. 15 or 20 residents regularly joining either here in the Facebook. So it's a good lecture. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Old Maski. If Arif Rahman, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. First of all, uh, I agree with any all comment? the wonderful. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, I agree with all the wonderful comments said by everybody that Dr. Firoz, this was an excellent, excellent lecture, a very good summary of how to read and interpret EKGs. And I think this is valuable for all our fellows because you know we should look at the EKG as a valuable tool. But one thing I also want to echo what Dr. Maski and Dr. Uh, uh, Akium Reza mentioned that yes, just because an EKG is normal, we should always evaluate the patient from a clinical perspective. We are clinicians. We should see what kind of symptoms they have. And we should try to use that as a complement to the clinical presentation of the patient because an EKG is normal. As he mentioned, we should get an echocardiogram to rule out any wall motion abnormality. So just because an EKG is normal, we should not assume that the patient is not having an acute coronary syndrome. That's something I'd like to add. And last but not least, you know, I always like to collaborate what we're doing in the United States with the excellent work that you guys are doing in Bangladesh. You know, one thing we're doing right now, I'm sure you've heard about it, is the door to unloading. You've heard about that is the door to unloading trial. So, so you know, studies have shown that ST elevation MI, heart size, correlates with heart failure and mortality. 
So Dr. Naveen Kapoor and his group in Boston have started looking at animal studies where they feel that if we actually unload the left ventricle first and then do revascularization, there may be a greater mortality benefit. And this is especially people coming in with anterior STEMIs. So we are actually one of the few sites, there's about 20 sites that have got approval for FDA. So what will end up happening is that any patients who come in with an anterior MI who are hemodynamically stable, we are actually gonna bring them to the cath lab and we're gonna put an impella, which is a mechanical support device. I'm sure you've all heard of that. And we're gonna keep that on for about 30 minutes and then we'll do the revascularization just to see if there's any benefit in terms of you know, reducing the LV unloading time and in terms of reducing the overall infarct size. So it's just something I wanted to share with you guys that we're doing here in the United States and hopefully inshallah you'll see the data soon. I have one question regarding that impella in acute MI. May I ask with uh, permission from? Yeah, please. But I think oh, if is uh, not in contact. Hello, Hello, yeah. Arif, sir. Do you hear me, sir? Arif, Arif is lost contact. Oh. Atel, sir, do you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, my question is, sir, my... you get is a conduction or any. Uh, Panduva's block in case of still with MI, as fellows discuss. But regarding your open comments, you can this issue for the fellows or for, for us. Yeah, regarding localization? Regarding the or Panduva's block in case of equity of mine. Moshin, your question yes, is sir. about the na, your question is about the bundle branch block. A, yeah, his yes, question is, if yes, sir. Yes, sir. Patients of bandura block, can it sometimes help us in localization of the culprit artery? It was nicely described by Firoz Lake, sir. First of all, yes, sir. Yes, sir. There are actually, only few things we have to memorize. This is a good lecture, excellent lecture covering all the things. But from this lecture, yes. we have to summarize. And we have to keep some of the points we have to, uh, that is, uh, when, uh, usually we practice. As for example, in case of the right coronary artery, right versus LCX, RCA proximal versus uh, uh, distal, then the yes, uh, inferior with or without posterior like this. So in case of the bundle yes, branch block, as for example, in case of the LE deletion, what happens in case of the LE deletion, what is nice, actually nicely again described by the uh, Firoz, that is the LE deletion proximal to the uh, first septal artery, between the first septal and diagonal artery, this side of the diagonal artery, like this. So, about the bundle branch block in case of the LED. First of all, there is a chance of right bundle branch block in case of the LED proximal lesion that is the proximal to the first septal artery, but we don't see always that is right bundle branch block, although the lesion is proximal to the first septal artery. Why? This is one thing we have to describe that is. There is, that is the LED proximal lesion proximal to the first septal artery, not always associated with the right bundle branch block. So the answer is that the, that is the right bundle branch sometimes in case of the two Give supply. Supply, may have got the dual supply. Yes. They may have the dual supply. So although there is LED lesion, the right bundles may be protected in that situation and the right <laughs> bundle branch block and even there is a chance of the reverse question earlier. So this is again one question. Again, the proximal lesion sometimes may be associated with the other bundle branch block or the complete heart block, but not on always cases. Why? Again, the same thing. That is the his bundle has got the that is LED that is the uh, blood supply from the uh, left circle uh, left side in most of the time, but it may have got the dual blood supply. As for example, the anterior fascicle usually has got the single blood supply, but the posterior fascicle usually has got the dual blood supply. So right bundle brass block in most of the time is associated with the left anterior fascicular block, but not the posterior fascicular block as because posterior fascicle is most of the time protected. So the combination of the bundle brass block and the AV nodal block in association with the STABI sometimes helps to localize the lesion. That is whether it is a proximal to the first septal artery 
or distal to the first artery. That is a distal to the diagonal artery. It is not associated with the right vertebral branch block or the even or that is a uh, contraction defect. It is always associated with the ST elevation of the V2 to V6, not the V1. If V1 is escaped, it is distal to the diagonal. So, so uh, uh, am I clear, Moshin? Or uh, you want to uh, learn something more? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. I think also we can ask the question to Dr. RF. RF is now, uh, uh, has come back now. Yeah, Ashok. Ashok, your question. You have to unmute Ashok. Unmute, please. Ashok, do you hear me? Thank you, sir. Your question. Uh, that, that is an important issue of use of ECMO in acute MI, anterior MI. But e half an hour, if the patient is kept on ECMO. Uh, impala, impala, not ECMO. Impala, impala. Impala. But anyhow, uh, that will delay the revascularization. That means uh, that we got to, to balloon time. So uh, which one we, uh, is better? Earlier uh, to balloon or revascularization time or impella then stabilization or uh, subsequently revascularization? So that's a very good question, Dr. Ashok. So what they're doing is that they have animal studies where they did a head-to-head -head comparison where they found that you know, if they do the unloading for 30 minutes using an impella and then revascularization, yes, you may have delayed it for beyond 90 minutes, but they said that the outcome was not much different. And in fact, the outcome was better on the animal models. So that's yeah. why based on this, they had to go through an FDA approval to justify why we are purposely delaying a door to balloon time by putting this device in. So FDA did approve it based on the animal study. But I think the whole concept is that yes, we are revascularization. And you know, there may be like a 15 to 20 minute delay overall, but if we're able to reduce the infarct size, will help, you know, help long-term mortality benefits. So the FDA has approved it and uh, it'll be very interesting to see what will end up happening. And I, I think they were hoping to present it in ACC, but I don't know because of the COVID if things are gonna get delayed or not. Thank you, Doctor. But, very interesting. Yeah, but they're not gonna. But for those patients, they're not gonna follow door to balloon time. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Some small word, sir. Any issues or comments to discuss? Thank you very much. Actually, uh, nothing much to comment. An excellent presentation, Piroz. My congratulations to you. It's absolutely fantastic academic lecture. I understand the anatomy, the most important thing. My actually my own practice, I personally have to try my best to uh, actually uh, correlate the anatomy with the ECG. Whenever I miss, I think the things I have not matched. I go back to the ECG again, try to uh, do my mistakes. Actually, as everybody mentioned, it doesn't work all the time uh, in the twice. And my advice to uh, to to fellows that you practice the same. If they have VKP as algorithm. In your pocket, or hang in a uh, post, small poster on the in the system. When you do the ECG, I will look the algorithm, try to match it. After angiogram, you come back and see it again. That will give you actually because otherwise, if you keep everything in memory, it's very difficult. It's a huge, very difficult to keep in memory all the algorithms, all the uh, work order. Thank you very much. Excellent lecture. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, I have one question also to the panelists regarding unstable yeah. or non stemi Yes, please. Well, uh, actually, ST segment elevation is very much specific to the uh, territory and site of lesion. That is true for TMT also. But ST elevation is non-specific. Sometimes we face the problem, Dr. Saidur and others are here, non stemi patient, uh, after doing angiogram, TBD we are seen. LAD 80, 90, RCA uh, 70, 80, LCX also critical. So in these circumstances, anyway, sometimes triple facial revascularization is not possible in the same setting due to monetary or patient's hemodynamics. So who is vessel we should revascularize uh, from ECG guided? Uh, if anyone have any idea, Dr. Piroz, <laughs> yeah, I think you have uh, learn, uh, you have uh, read a lot of things regarding this. Have you got any idea regarding this? Uh, what was the close? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry I, I missed the question, sir. The question? The question is, 
Uh, uh, can I... Sorry, sir, can, you, can, you can explain it, sir. The question is, in case of non-STMI, we do the NGO, we find multiple arteries as very critical lesion and we are not sure which one of them is the priority uh, artery, infarcturated artery. Now, if it is possible, it were possible, it's better to uh, revascularize all three. But now, if the patient cannot afford it or because of the hemodynamics, we have to do the most important one and defer for the other arteries later on. How can I choose in this situation? Uh, I think uh, the guideline mainly talks about the culprit lesion in ST elevation MI. Yes. Non ST elevation MI, they don't uh, talk too much about the uh, culprit lesion or how much uh, lesion you should intervene, whether you should revascularize all the lesion or not. It's difficult to see. But to me, uh, you should look at the area of supply. You should look at the which artery which is supplying the maximum amount of the myocardium. This is one important thing that will give you the maximum protection. Another important thing, which lesion is showing the acute change. The lesion which has got a, some fissuring or has got some thrombus, most likely that lesion has made the patient unstable. So you can go, go for the, that lesion also. So you can go in two ways, either, uh, either protect the maximum amount of myocardium or, uh, uh, or deal the most unstable lesion. Actually, actually uh, Dr. Firoz, uh, actually in, in this situation, echo. a bedside echo can tell you uh, which one is involved. Yeah. Uh, here, I, will, uh, I, 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 I can add something that uh, uh, when there is a non-ST segment elevated MI, but typical symptom of acute MI, in that case, uh, actually, I uh, prefer to compare the ECG if there is any previous ECG of that patient, old ECG, if it is present, then you can compare the, the current ECG with the previous ECG, whether any shuttle change is there. Sometimes very shuttle change can tell you that uh, this patient have uh, myocardial infarction or serial ECG. If you have uh, any uh, doubt, or no previous comparing ECG, then you can do a serial ECG and the change you have to look for. Any shuttle change, then uh, you can uh, give some clue of that uh, uh, the patient, uh, whether the, uh, he has got MI or not. And regarding the non-ST MI with multiple vessel disease, uh, I think uh, the uh, other uh, physiology has been changed in, in this heart because there is multiple collaterals there. So there are some uh, revascularization from other side. These are the main main uh, cause for uh, a patient not to give the actual picture in the ECG. But there is a uh, multiple vessel disease. So in that case, I think uh, ECHO is the best answer. And during uh, angiography, you, know, you can look for the culprit artery, whether there, if there is a 100% lesion with a, a retrograde filling, then this is a chronic lesion. If there is a, 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 a lesion that is uh, ugly looking, thrombus containing, uh, then this is maybe a culprit lesion. And uh, in this situation, ECHO will guide you which uh, one is the culprit lesion. Thank you. Uh, can I have a question? Does, does um, IVAS has got any role in finding out the culprit lesion? I think <sighs> I, I, really, I don't I, think so. I don't think so. Actually, no. Actually, every every, every NSMI is different. Every NSMI yes. is different. You have to judge every NSMI uh, in its own way. Judge yeah. clinical history, as Rajas pointed out, culprit history, it, previous CCG, new echo. And when you do the angiogram, it is not necessarily the culprit artery has to be revascularized. It depends on actually what's the problem. And to answer the question, actually not the uh, IBUS, actually FFR will give you better guidance. Yes, uh, whether, whether, whether you're going to, yes. uh, uh, apart from uh, culprit artery, you have to revascularize the other one. Suppose you have got a, in a non ST inferior in the PDA. You've done the PDA, but there's 90% in the LD. You can't leave LED behind. 
So it will judge individually every case. Uh, yeah, the, po the point That's the point right. is the point point is not on whether the non culprit vessel has to be revascularized the point is to find if we suspect uh, uh, one or more arteries if you can decide which one is the culprit artery actually sir uh, mr uh, sir actually regarding ipas is not uh, so uh, simple actually this is a very bulky structure in acute coronary syndrome uh, so bulky uh, especially the older ipas uh, in a uh, unstable plaque uh, you sh when you are sure that you are going to do the angioplasty then i think that machine should be that uh, device should be put into a coronary artery otherwise sometimes a stable plaque become unstable after <laughs> putting ipas yeah uh, dr bokhla sahib on call yes yeah. yeah yeah Any comment regarding this? I was in. Uh, no, just I want to start from the beginning first because this is a very interesting topic in cath lab manual uh, lecture series. So I, I think Vadud Bhai has got is very witty uh, to pick up these topics and to keep it in our cath lab manuals. It's head spinning, and uh, Firoz, my fellow DMCians, so he has put it very well there. But obviously, it is head spinning. We have to start since my third year in DMC life to to read the ECGs again and to see the other things and how the leads are going and which way it is facing, and of course the head and the tail of the vectors and to see the reciprocal changes, blah blah. So many things you have. This is from clinician perspective is very important, but from diehard interventionist perspective, that's a little bit different. So the different in that sense that whenever a MI primary MI is say a stillivation MI is coming in the emergency, our mid-level doctors or fellows are calling that yeah there is an, a primary a, that should be a primary PCI. So I used to call tell or it, it has to be told that which MI and he is telling entry MI okay take the patient back. So I am in the cath lab. I am seeing the angio. I am doing the angiogram and I am seeing that which one is the problem and I will do it. So I don't need to see the even. I, I'm, sometimes I don't have time to see the ECG even, or sometimes I'm not seeing that one deliberately. Sometimes because I'm I'm seeing that one from in, from inside the heart. So that is one thing. But still, these things, so this ECG is very important. This understanding this is very important when, especially like in right uh, right sided right-sided problems, like whether it is an LCX, whether it's an RCA. So which one is the culprit one? That's a big decision. And when we were, like back in before 2010, when I was a femoralist, at that time, you know that this is also another thing to preserve the time, to, to keep the time less, means that you, when you are seeing an ECG, that is an anterior MI, what we used to do before, that we used to take an RCA diagnostic catheter, and then we are taking a guide catheter for left system. Two, 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 just, uh, just uh, listening the time for PCI, primary PCI. And for the other perspectives like non-HTMI or HTMI, these are, you know, these are very, very different things. Like for IVAS, what you were telling, IVAS means that what we used to say when the starting of the IVAS was there, at that time used to say, if you, it's ocular stenotic reflex, want to stand some artery, do IVAS. Don't want to stand, or if you have some hesitation not to stand, do the FFR. So IVAS is sometimes, nowadays, uh, the, Dr. Osho said it is very bulky device. Nowadays, the, uh, the IVAS in Boston, IVAS are very thin and uh, too French compatible. So it's not that much robust nowadays. So it's easily possible uh, in, even in through five French catheter, you can go for an IVAS. That's possible. But for the culprit mode artery, what Dr. Equim was telling by showing, seeing the echocardiography, that is also a little bit I'm differing in that way that, uh, that sometimes it's, a, it's a eye estimation, you know. You didn't see the echo before, or you have seen an echo report from before, but that one has been done by somebody, and eyeball estimation is totally, totally different. So if you see an echocardiography now at this acute setting, 
And then you are seeing that akinetic, or you can say it is hypokinetic to akinetic. If it's an akinetic wall, inferior wall, and a hypokinetic to, to akinetic anterior wall, and you have seen a 99% stenosis in the RCA and also in the LED, which one is the culprit most? Then that echocardiogram, according to your eyeball estimation, that's not the, uh, the standard, gold standard. That is the your according to your own eyeball estimation is telling okay the anterior wall should be intervened first to be to be treated first so I will go for LED but not the RCA sometimes in acute in inferior mind you have seen a 99 percent block in obtuse marginal branch and 100 percent occlusion in RCA what you will do both are co-dominant vessels. What you will do, but 100% occlusion, but at the same time, there are faint retrograde flow in the PD and PLV from the left system. So which one you're going to, you are going to, at that time, sometimes if you can understand like Firoz, like you can memorize that those things that in the AVL or ST depression somewhere V3, V4, wherever it is, it is 50% more, 50% of the ST depression or 2.5 millimeter, so all that criteria, all that algorithms, that can help a little bit. But you know that at that time also time is very, very, very short at that time. So what you will do at that time, that's there, those are the disparate, like two days back I have done it. That RCA is occluded, but patient has a 99% stenosis in the obtuse marginal branch. But fortunately, that patient has the ejection fraction is well preserved, it's only 55%. So which one is the culprit mode? It is like an inferior, inferior lateral estilivation. So in that case, what will, which one I will intervene? So when I've gone to intervene, the, I've seen that it's an optimal marginal mode. I have done it first. Easily it has been done because there's a supply. And apparently it was looking that the RC is also totally occluded, but it is softish. It doesn't look like it's tapering and the very faint feeble retrograde flow is there because sometimes the collaterals may arise even in a stillivation in mind. You can see some collateral. It doesn't mean that there is no hard and fast rule that there you have collaterals means it's not acute occlusion, not like that. So when, I would, and then when I have gone to intervene the RCA, it was like a CTO. So these are the questions, still there are some gray zones here, especially for the right-sided MIs. Very gray, very gray zones are there. So there I need the, the Vadudbhai and uh, so Dr. Professor Arthur Ali like persons to understand the ICG within at a glimpse and to say and to tell me that, yeah, this is obviously a anterior MI where above the diagonal one or below the diagonal one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Sharia Kovit, do you hear me? Dr. Sharia Kovit? Dr. Sharia? Yes, yes, Dr. Moshi. Yes. Uh, yeah. You have any question or comments? Uh, and thank you, Dr. Moshi. Actually, I have uh, learned a lot uh, from my friend, uh, Dr. Firoz, from his brilliant lecture and also from my current teachers as a student of cardiology. What I have learned, I can tell only this. Uh, number one, Culprit vessel identification is only for a stillution event, not for non stillution event, for which uh, a reverse fashion uh, will be determined by, by some clinical, by some ECG, previous history, and some uh, imaging modalities like echocardiography, IFAS, FFR, uh, and by angiography. Number two, repeat ECG. Uh, to be done, particularly if the ECG is normal, or uh, some non-specific ST T changes or ST depression is seen. Number three is uh, we have to assess the ischemic vector for the perception uh, of this, all these things uh, in the lecture. Uh, actually, it is very difficult to memorize all the things if we, if we can uh, learn about the ischemic vector, uh, we can make our perception clear. Number three, uh, ST depression may not be simple, may not be non ST division MI. Actually, uh, uh, ST depression may be an early feature of ST elevation in a distant site or opposite to ST depression sites. And uh, uh, sometimes widespread ST uh, depression may be a feature of 
left main or proximal LED lesion, particularly if there is ST elevation in AVR or V1. So uh, I have learned uh, probably these things from uh, today's lecture. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank, you Frank. thank you, Thank you for taking your message. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, Sophia, madam, is it? Yes, yes, I, I, I see. I, I see. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, do you hear me? Dr. Ibrahim? Uh, yes, friend. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I must thank uh, my brilliant friend, Muhammadullah Firoz, for his excellent presentation. Uh, we have learned a lot. I have one, one question. Uh, sometimes, uh, do you hear me? Yes, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Sometimes we face some uh, non stillivated uh, my patient uh, with high, very high risk or high risk criteria. Uh, and we do early CAG and we see total occlusion of any artery. Uh, how we can explain this? There is no ST elevation, but, but there is total occlusion. How we can explain this? Amadullah Firoz or Atari sir? Uh, Firoz, sir. Firoz, sir. Sir, Atari sir. Amadullah Firoz, yeah. Uh, this has got a, a number of explanation, maybe. Number uh, one, uh, in non STMI, it may be due to the occlu total occlusion of the smaller size vessel. Like if a total occlusion may be diagonal one or OM1, it can happen. Another important thing, if there is a well developed collaterals, in that case, that can also help yeah. uh, develop non ST elevation MI instead of ST elevation MI. These are the things important. Sometimes the ST elevation takes some time. Uh, sometimes this non-ST elevation may turn into ST elevation. Into ST elevation, yes. yes. Fantastic. Actually, actually, uh, Firoz is right that uh, if a main vessel that is LED have uh, had 99% lesion, but 1% is open. This patient have uh, unstable angina or, or angina pectoris before. But this patient may develop sudden acute MI. But in the meantime, when uh, the patient uh, sustained 99% lesion for a long time, then there is huge collateral from the right coronary or the LCX. In that situation, I think if the 100% lesion, uh, 99 become 100% lesion, then there may be no ST elevation MI. There may be some ST depression or some change without any change. As because, uh, uh, most of the time we uh, see by angiography that uh, the patient have typical symptom and uh, we do the ECG, uh, uh, angiography, the RCA is 100% lesion or LAD 100% lesion without any MI. There is no uh, uh, wall motion abnormality in echocardiography also. So how we can explain this? I, 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 I can explain it that it gradually gradually increasing the lesion and uh, in the meantime there is so many collaterals are developed and ultimately this uh, uh, 99 or 90 percent become 100 percent but patient is uh, sustained with this uh, 100 percent lesion so there are a lot of uh, variations is there so we cannot uh, only uh, rely on the ecg we, we should not rely on the ECG. We should, uh, in, in, every time, uh, emphasize on the clinical uh, scenario and other investigation tools also. Thank you. Mohsin, may, may... Can, I, can I add something, Mohsin? Uh, 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 yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The main mechanism that can be involved in Ibrahim case is there is always autothrombolysis of the thrombus. Thrombus has got a very dynamic, very changing dynamics in patients with acute cause. Yes, it forms and dissolves, it forms and it dissolves. So when you are doing the CAT, maybe at that time it has formed, but maybe in the next time it will be dissolved. This is one of the most important mechanisms uh, which can ex explain Mohsin's uh, question. So need the CDL ECG. You, as you said, the CDL ECG is the most important. Uh, yeah. ECG, ECG yes. takes some time, but, uh, but yes, yes, yes. dynamic process that occur with acute coronary syndrome, very dynamic process. There is occlusion, yeah. But at the same time, there is thrombolysis, autothrombolysis that dissolves it and it, it, the whole um, myocardial involvement then spares. 
Uh, and and, and uh, yeah. I would like to add, in case of uh, what Professor Mishkat has said, it is a very important phenomena. And in those cases, there might be a ischemic preconditioning of the myocardium. Previously, the myocardium is preconditioned and it can withstand uh, this uh, uh, episodes of short period of 100% uh, occlusion. And therefore, the, there is no ST elevation and it's, it's the resultant is the ST depression and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Can I add something? Yes, sir. Look at sir. the physiology of uh, atherosclerotic uh, coronary artery disease. It's a very slow growing process. Yards together going on, then resulting in something sinister. Look at the profile of the lesions that are involved in acute coronary syndrome. Most of these lesions are not severe lesions. They are 40 to 60 percent lesions are more prone to develop acute thrombus. There is unstable plaque and there is rupture. You can have a patient with three arteries, 99 percent blockade, very calcified and very good flow, very uh, good LV function, no ECD changes. And you do the NGO and become astonished. How can the patient survive? Because the plaque was very stable and calcification is a sign of that. It produces severe stenosis. It will produce chronic stable angina, but not acute coronary syndrome. So uh, these are things and collaterals, they develop over time and collaterals protect you. So any patient, who has a very normal ECG, a typical severe chest pain, ischemic chest pain, rest assured, you are going to have a patient on NGO who has triple vessel disease. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And that's the experience everyone has. Because here, one collector from one branch to one vessel to the other is protecting each other. And the ischemic preconditioning ensures that you do not get any ECG changes. You do not get any LV dysfunction, even on echo. And you do the cat and you find out you are dealing with a severe TVD. Vajan Bhai, just I want to add here that uh, that there you will see some patients uh, that uh, that with normal ejection fraction but only stable angina he has and he has come for angiogram and the ejection fraction is well preserved so whenever doing the angiogram especially because it's patient to patient varies sometimes actually i don't know the how much it is like this that there are so many fine collaterals Yes. To the Rentrops collaterals, but not like Rentrop grade 3, grade 4. It should be grade 5 collaterals, though there is no grade 5. But still, there are so many collaterals you can see there, which you may not see in some patients where it is not developing, even though it's a CTO. It has become CTO, but we get we get a few collaterals, but somewhere we get some patients, and that's the beauty of some patients' uh, survival purpose because of those collaterals so i don't know i am asking these questions also why why that that sort of difference sometimes happens among among the patients with same sort of morphology the same sort of pathology of the lesions i don't know uh, that yeah. Sorry. Sorry, probably you have not picked the right person for coronary angiogram if the patient has <laughs> collateral then he she, she should not be that symptomatic yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Very true. Yes. Uh, uh, Assalamu alaikum, madam. Subhay madam. Do you hear me, madam? Madam, Assalamu alaikum. Madam, unmute Karen. Madam, Assalamu alaikum. Madam, do you hear me? Yeah, uh, madam. Next again, I'm going to call you. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I last... yeah, thank you. Thank you. I've been, uh, it's an excellent um, presentation no doubt about it uh, excellent uh, presentation and uh, you has touched all the points uh, thank you um, the organizers both of you are doing very good uh, job uh, for this very interesting discussion uh, so many interesting points has come up and it's, if we talk about it we can talk a lot about it uh, like uh, you know um, uh, triple vessel uh, disease which one is severe like IV, uh, ivas like ffr then um, bedside echo all these important i just want to say a little bit about uh, say bedside echo is no doubt about it is very important is when uh, we in our time the mi patient used to be whether inferior or anterior 
they used to be in bed and bed rest for six weeks to three months what we saw even in england then uh, after that uh, this uh, thrombolysis has come so, so patient was thrombolyzed and in early 80s echo machine was uh, available in those um, in england so to the, that time bedside echo was not there but it was in the um, department of echo anyway the what was i'm trying to say there is another test you can the stress uh, do vitamin stress test one uh, can do but not in the acute situation to uh, find out viable myocardium that is one uh, one test also we don't practice here but uh, we used to see it in uh, those days the triple vessel which one is um, uh, culprit which one is not well discussion was uh, very good but uh, the, uh, there ivas has got very little role what to say that which one is cul uh, culprit lesion uh, this if, usually what we used to do uh, see uh, these uh, triple vessel if we cannot do three together but if we do two is the seeing the supply of the vessel which is the most uh, myocardium is covered by those vessel is used to do it now you have got echo to bedside to assess if if you can assess that this is better so the uh, dominant vessel if they have got problem it, if, if you have triple vessel but you have got a dominant vessel and that must be treated and that we used to do that after that you know you do the next vessel and then next vessel like that and uh, these uh, drugs, what we have uh, spoken that ECG, see in our time, the, the why? Because our teaching was not like that, the ECG to correlate with the uh, angiogram. Now yeah, the time has come and it has developed that you, if you are, do, uh, we are doing uh, primary PCI and if you do the primary PCI, if you can see uh, the ECG and you can decide what to do next is better. But as, as, as somebody was saying that it, uh, this is also in our, in our time, what we used to do, quickly do the right coronary and check um, whether there is anything with the diagnostic and then go for, uh, take a guide catheter for the left. Or if you think it is a ECG shows that there is a right problem, you can do the vice versa. This can be done easily. But uh, uh, I think a lot of the places we don't have the bedside echo practice, which uh, is definitely guide you uh, nicely. Not everybody has got uh, IBUS or FFR. IBUS is not going to help there, but it will help you to do intervention. But the FFR might help uh, if you have that. But then again, you know, if you if you uh, if we do have it, then you can do it. But other than that, what you have discussed is a excellent and a nice way on you have, uh, all of you has contributed very nicely for the students. All I can say that if you have a patient with MI, you check um, ECG if needed before, even um, before going to the OT, make sure uh, cath lab, I mean, uh, make sure the you know, what you are seeing in the ECG and then you can do the angiogram and, and do the rest. One other thing I would like to, I'm interested in to see that after doing this primary procedure, what is the ECG like after? That is what seeing also, but you have done a primary PCI. So you have shown the ECG, you have, then you have revascularized the patient. Then what was the ECG after that? It is what's showing to the student that you see what has happened and what is, and also bedside echo, what it was before and now what it is after the primary PCI. These are the two things I think we can highlight later on and do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last comment on Professor Atari, sir. Atari, sir, please wrap up the discussion. Atari, sir, do you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, thank, yes, you you Moshin, for, uh, yeah. thank you, Moshin, for inviting me in this uh, brilliant session. I first of all like to congratulate Dr. Mohammed Allah Firuz, as described by our all uh, panelist, that is the ex uh, that talk was very much excellent, and he has covered all the things that is necessary for discussion about this topic. But for our participants, most of the students, I think, I can draw only few comments. We cannot memorize all the things what is actually described by uh, Muhammad Allah Firuz. It is academic lecture; he can tell. But summary of this lecture, dear participants, we can try only to memorize few things. That is, 
we, we, we shall try to define that is the ride versus RCA versus LCX. RCA proximal versus distal as described by Firoz, that is the lead AVR. Then use of the lead one and AVL for defining LCX versus RCA. Then lead uh, role of the v, lead V2 for defining the LED proximal and LED distal and role of the uh, reciprocal set. Only there are the few things that is daily practice clinically we are using. So among the lecture, we can draw a, that is a take home message that is practically useful, but it is the beauty of the discussion that is many of the different, that is our uh, brilliant participants as nicely described, nice, nice question and beautiful part of contribution from all our participants. So Mohsin, I think it was an excellent session on the ECG for localizing the culprit lesion, its practical use. And I am very much proud to be here and I have learned a lot from this lecture. Actually, uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you everybody, sir. Thank you all expert panel. Super Madam, Madam here at, at 11 p.m. Uh, thank you, Madam. <laughs> all the panelists, thank you, everybody. Uh, we start STMI session from today. Uh, next session on 3rd third, uh, third December, on Thursday at 9, 9 p.m., Dr. Aptab Khan from India. He will talk on STMI protocol management in PCI and non-PCI center. Management of STMI protocol okay. in case of PCI and non-PCI center, Aptab Khan from India. He also a brilliant uh, speaker. Yeah. We know everybody. Uh, Professor Abdul Sir, please uh, conclude the session. Professor Abdul Sir. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, from our uh, pioneer interventionist, Professor Sufi Rahman Mehta, to all the students who have been along with us in this journey of a learning adventure, we really enjoy joining with all of you in discussing, in presenting in elaborating, in questioning. And we enjoy the sessions tremendously. We hope that we will all grow uh, in our knowledge, in our skill, in our practice to become a more, more advanced, more knowledgeable, and more accurate doctors. That should be our aim. And these programs are uh, for that reason. Dr. Mosin is working so hard and also all the presenters, all the panelists and the people from Beximco Pharma, all of them are contributing so much in achieving that goal. Thank you everybody. And Firod, you really deserve accolade from all of us. You have done a wonderful job. Thank you. Good night. Thank you Dr. Arif Roman. Dr. Arul Maski from uh, Nepal and USA. Dr. Arif, thank you so much for your... Uh, thank you. It's my pleasure and good to see you all. Stay on safe. Third, uh, you, are, you are third November with STMI protocol at the excellent session talked by the Dr. Aptak Khan from India. December. Yeah, our third December on Thursday. Inshallah. Stay Inshallah. I'll try to attend. Inshallah. 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 Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Everybody stay safe. Alaikum. আজকে রিকোয়েস্ট করলো আমাকে কোনো আইসিউ পাইনি ঢাকা